doing this on Zoom. Obviously, we don't have um, you know the option to do it in person, although we're getting close. Um, is because it's very interactive. It's generally a uh, you know an open conversation. I generally ask people. You know, I, I wrote this book called "Your Job Search Is a Bare Knuckle Fight." So I ask people. You know, why do you think? You know, I, I appreciate that some of you guys mentioned in your discussions or the summary of discussions. I appreciate that you mentioned bare knuckle. To me, I always say to people, why do you think I named the book Your Job Search is a Bare Knuckle Fight? And everybody, you know, comes up with a whole host of different things, you know, and, you know, oh, it's a bloody battle. You know, there's, you know, it's, it's rough out there. And I get that. And it's all right. But the fact of the matter is, is the reason I titled it that is because when you think of a bare knuckle fight, you think of, at least what I think of is that there are no rules, right? People beat the crap out of each other. And that's what people need to understand in the job search. I don't know about you guys, and I can't see everybody and whether or not you'd raise your hand, but how many times people have said, well, you've got to follow the rules. HR says you got to follow our process. You've got to apply here. You've got to fill this out. You can't talk to hiring managers. You've got to work with me. To me, that's a bunch of malarkey, man. I, until I sign on the dotted line as an employee, I can call whoever I want. And it is really important within the, within the, the confines of you know, ethical standards. I'm not talking about something that is unethical. I'm just talking about, you, you know how many times I've called a hiring manager to try to work on a job for them or get a new client and they say, well, you've got to talk to you know, you got to talk to Marge in HR, right? So I call Marge in HR and she says, what do you mean you called Jim, the, the CFO? You're not allowed to call Jim. I, I honestly, at last I checked, it's a free country. I can pick up the phone and call whoever the hell I want. So don't tell me that I can't call Jim. Jim understands the real need at the company, okay? And he understands being opportunistic if I'm marketing a good candidate. So um, I'm very hard-nosed about this stuff and I'm very blunt about it and I don't appreciate rules and you know I I, 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 I went a very good friend of mine lost his job after 16 years at a, a publicly traded company it was a six weeks before a, a cliff vest of his equity it was a disaster he had twins on the way and um, I actually told this story not too long ago in one of the Fang meetings and somebody in the crowd actually guessed who it was and he was right um, but it was it was it was kind of crazy. But the fact of the matter is, is when I was coaching him in how to get his new job, I brought him to my office in the city. Right now, I, I moved my office, thank God, to Lake Success. But I came in and I, I, I suggest make some suggestions on how we can um, make phone calls to hiring managers. Um, and he said he didn't want to bother them. It was uncomfortable and he didn't want to bother people. And I said, well, you can either you know, be uncomfortable bothering people and maybe get somewhere you can be uncomfortable and unemployed. Um, and not getting anywhere. So I think he kind of got the message. So that's the nature of my presentation and who we are. And um, I'm very blunt when I, I've been in sales all my life. So a lot of this is a lot easier all my life, meaning I started on the phone as a cold caller for Smith Barney in, in 1990 at 18 years old, calling 250 people a day to try to get them to qualify them to see how much money they had in the market and qualify them for a broker that I work for. So I've probably made more phone calls than most human beings on the face of the earth these days. So um, uh, I'm going to encourage you guys to do the same. So um, just moving along, uh, I start off with some quotes, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence is the key to unlocking our potential. I don't fancy myself strong. I don't fancy myself intelligent. I just don't stop. We talked about rebuilding your network. You can rebuild your network by picking up the phone and calling people and introducing yourself. You can't let circumstances dictate your future. So I talk to people about this all the time. If you know, I have some recruiters who had to reinvent themselves because their businesses were steeped in automotive. And for a long time, the automotive industry was was challenging. So they morphed into high tech manufacturing and they but they said I didn't have a network. So I said, pick up the phone and start calling people in high tech manufacturing, explain that you're an en engineer and, and exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so again, it's a matter of, of continuous effort. Now, when I worked for Career Builder, there was a gentleman who I worked for by the name of Bob Montgomery. He was one of the most quotable individuals I've ever worked for. And he gave me um, a really, I think, profound quote, and it's really the way I live my life. And there are two ways to be successful in this world. The first one is be really, really good at something. And 
I'm talking like, you know, Michael Jordan good at things, right? You know, you can be a great basketball player, a great athlete. That's not something that I subscribe to. But what I subscribe to is the other option, which is do things, quite frankly, that other people aren't willing to do. And to me, I go back to phone calls, guys. Most people aren't willing to, to pick up the phone, call somebody they don't know, and introduce themselves and give them their value proposition. All right. So um, I live my life this way. I mean, it, from the simplest of ways, like when I used to commute, and I always use this example because I think it's perfect. And most of you can kind of picture the Seventh uh, Avenue staircase leading up from Penn Station, or at least the old Penn Station. Every morning I used to take the train into the city and there are two big staircases that were extremely empty and two escalators along the outside that had lines all the way back to Amtrak, right? And I, I would be the one who was always taking the, um, the stairs and because other people weren't willing to do it. And I wanted to get up top first and I was always waking up and I was hustling and running as fast as I can. So you all have to do the same thing. So those are just two quotes that I like to live by. But when it comes to, you know, practical things, the internet obviously has had, and for the last 20 years, I've been talking about this. There are some industries that, you know, it really hasn't changed. But other industries, it has changed forever. And for you guys, the internet has had a major impact on searching for jobs. And guess what? It's ever changing. The list of sites on the right side used to be Career Builder, Monster, Hot Jobs, and Dice, right? It's a complete, now it's a different world and LinkedIn dominates it. LinkedIn is now owned by Microsoft, who obviously knows how to, to monetize um, users and the website, they're being very difficult with me. They're charging a lot of money, which is, guess what? It's making it harder for me to find people like you. So it's a constant challenge, but you have to realize the internet cannot be used as a crutch. It empowers human resources because they don't want to talk to you. They say, apply to the job online. And that's where I want you to break the rules, guys. I want you to find, use the internet, use LinkedIn to find somebody that you think is somewhere close to the hiring manager for the job you're searching for. My point is use it as a tool. As soon as, so we talk about the difference between presenting your resume or submitting your resume. Once you submit your resume to a job posting, your power is gone. Pick up the phone, make a phone call, give somebody, and, and, and Enzo mentioned it earlier. When I was talking to, um, to my group earlier, we were talking about making sure that you provide quantifiable accomplishments on the phone to people that, are, that you think are relevant to your search. Human resources doesn't care how many days you reduce the month end close. Human resources doesn't care that you found a tax opportunity that made the company an extra $100 million. They don't understand that. You need to be able to provide value to somebody who cares. Companies are not good. Did you have a question, Lou? Uh, it, it, actually, you mentioned Enzo, and he asked a question in the chat. Um, how do you quickly get a list of the hiring managers that are relevant to your target companies? And I think you just answered it from the standpoint of you have to research it within uh, the company on LinkedIn, search the company. You can also use the FANG database. Uh, we've got you know, 35,000 members uh, of the FANG who someone may have been or may be at the company that you're targeting. And um, you know, so go through LinkedIn and do the best job you can. You can get to somebody on through LinkedIn um, and get in touch with them and then and try and get their phone number. You can just call the general number usually and get through. Um, and if it's the right person, great. If it's the if it's not the right person, they may give you the avenue to get there. And in a couple of slides, you're going to see that I have a, some screenshots of the LinkedIn advanced search. Um, and I was actually thinking that maybe I'd take you to the site, but we'll see how it goes. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll show you exactly uh, how Enzo, and uh, I think it'll be useful. Companies, by and large, talent acquisition groups, um, honestly, they're terrible at using the internet. 
um, to to search and to find people. And they just believe like, you know, we can, if you go back to when I started in this industry in the late nineties, there was very little companies could do to recruit. They would post a job in the times and, you know, on Sunday times where it was two big fat sections. And then everybody used to fax their resumes. I used to walk in to my recruiting office in, in 1997, 98. And under the fax machine was a pile of curly papers. Right. And that was all the resumes that got faxed in Um, companies today. They believe that it's almost like a a crutch for them, too, that they utilize um, the Internet and they don't need you to contact them because they believe that they can find you. And it's not true because they're not good at it, because they're not driven, to be honest with you. The same reason that makes most recruiters suck um, is is the thing that makes them good at using technology. And that's because um, they're driven by commissions right? Internally, they're not. Um, So um, it's important to understand that. Use it as a tool, like I said, not as a crutch. Use it for research, but don't relinquish your power by immediately applying to a job. Far too many companies will just get, and in this day and age, the amount of applications we get to jobs is absolutely absurd. we're constantly encouraging people to use the phone. To lose point, you know, a lot of companies these days, because people are working remotely, believe it or not, if you get, you call the either the direct dial or you call the main number, and I would encourage you to do it early in the morning, okay? And we, we'll talk more about this. I encourage people to get up, call the main number at a company at 7.30 so you don't get a receptionist. You get an automated dialer. And then you find the person you want to call, you dial in their name, you get their extension. And there's very good possibility that they've left their cell phone on that number because they're not going into the office anymore. And to me, that's gold. All right. That you've got to pick up the phone and call their cell phone. People are using their cell phones more than ever now um, than before. It's a black hole, guys, more than ever before. The amount of people that are applying to jobs, resumes just sit in people's inboxes and it becomes this, you know, the the worst thing is, is most of these companies say, well, we have to post the job, right? Maybe they have to post it for two weeks, but nobody monitors it. And guess what? Talent acquisition groups within companies are, have been decimated during the pandemic. So you may have one admin who's posting the job and then everybody applies and then nobody gets back to them because it's, it's like an overwhelming amount of resumes have come into that box. I'd prefer to be the person. And this is a perfect example. I have a recruiter who works for me. Um, her name's Nancy. And um, I got 234 applications four years ago for a recruiter job. Um, one person picked up the phone and called me. That person was Nancy. And you know why Nancy called me? She left me a voicemail. And she said, my name is Nancy Bergman, and um, I'm sure I'm one of many that have applied to your job. But the reason I'm calling you is you probably put my resume at the bottom of the list because I'm a clinical psychologist who wants to shift my career and become a recruiter. I'd really appreciate it if you gave me a call back. And who who do you think I called and hired? I didn't even have to interview anybody else. And she works for me now, and she's phenomenal at what she does. Okay, so it is just simply the act of picking up the phone and being somebody who's different and leaving an impactful voicemail, an honest, confident voicemail. The other thing is, is in a lot of cases, companies may not post their jobs anymore because they don't want all those people applying to the job. So again, it leans much more towards picking up the phone and calling. So Jeff, John Ferrara had a, a question, which I think you've answered, but uh, do you apply and present or don't apply at all? I'd prefer to try to get somebody on the phone first. I'd rather get my resume to a hiring manager, have it filtered to HR that way than getting it over to HR first. You've got to think, and we're going to talk in a little bit about uh, buying influence as a, at a company. Right. So um, and we're going to talk, uh, we'll, we'll go more into depth about um, how companies buy services. And quite frankly, hiring is like company buying, right? They're buying you. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. But the fact is, I said this earlier, it's a sales job. 
make phone calls, call hiring managers early and late, be intuitive, get up, shower, make phone calls. I'd rather you put your feet up on the desk, read the newspaper and have a cup of coffee at 9 a.m. Because guess what? That's when everybody else is trying to call those people. Call them beforehand. If you're going to send emails and let's say you're doing it, this is a little trick, delay your emails. If anybody has, if you guys have Outlook, it really makes it easy. You can actually delay delivery of your email until the next morning. Folks, we more than ever before are having trouble getting people on the phone. There's no doubt about it. Um, studies have been shown. Well, there's one industry um, trainer in the recruiting industry who said that what used to take 14 dials now takes 114 dials. So we've developed a cadence that we try everything. We don't even call them dials anymore. It's outbound touches. How many times do we have to reach out to somebody either through voicemail, email, in mail or text seven times in 14 days to get somebody on the phone. So that's how hard it is for us. You can expect, you know, how hard, and that's what we're used to doing. I'm not necessarily saying that you guys go that hard. If, if you're, if you have a, leave a good, strong voicemail about your value proposition and you're not a recruiter, there's a higher likelihood someone's going to call you back. Market yourself and have a script. And when I talk to my group earlier, it's about, you know, they were talking about um, increasing customers and they were talking about uh, international banking and they were talking about statutory reporting and technical accounting and all the things that they do. It's not a matter of what you do when you pitch yourself. It's a matter of what you've accomplished for a company. Where have you made a company money? Where have you saved a company money? Did you create an efficiency? Did you put a system in place that's still being used? You have to advance the conversation. In sales, we talk about features, advantages, and benefits, okay? Features are what you do. Advantages are why you're better than the next guy. But more importantly, the benefits are, what are what's in it for the person on the other end of the phone. You have to understand that people listen to one radio station. It's W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Okay, so keep that in mind. We talked about this earlier. If you think you're bothering somebody, you've got to you've got to put that. You have to compare bothering someone with you being unemployed. What's more bothersome? Planning is key. I always talk about about calling people in blocks, not researching a phone call and then making a phone call. Plan ten calls. Plan fifteen calls. Get into a groove. Get excited, feel good about making contact with somebody. We have so much more information today about each other, but so much less connection than we've ever had. The fact that I go into most meetings and I before I talk to candidates, I, I know what they're all about from their LinkedIn profile. When I, when I started placing people in, in, in my own business, um, if I wanted to get to a controller, I used to call accounts payable, not have a name of somebody, but you know, the receptionist would always put me through to accounts payable, right? So I'd, I'd ask for accounts payable, they'd give me somebody and somebody would pick up and say, you know, hi, this is Jim and accounts payable. Oh, hey, Jim, you know, the person at the front told me that you're the controller. Oh no, I'm not the controller, the controller is Shelly. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jim, can I talk to Shelly? Then I'd get Shelly on the phone, okay? Times have changed massively. We know people's names, we know their histories, their backgrounds, their interests, but we don't do anything with it. We just expect we're going to connect electronically. If I were you guys, most of you probably have advanced degrees. You have different certifications. Go and find somebody who went to the school you went to. Leave that on their voicemail. Hey, I'm a fellow alum from Michigan State. Um, here's who I am. Here's what I do. I'd love to catch up. Please give me a call back but plan these calls out, be intuitive, find companies you wanna work for. I think people, and this goes to the whole job posting thing, like people start with the job posting. I prefer to start with a company I wanna work with. So go find companies in your local area that you wanna work with, because a lot of times if they're not posting their jobs, you're not gonna even know they exist. There are a lot of industrial parks around Long Island that are sort of hidden gems that people don't even know what's in those industrial parks. 
Start doing research for companies in certain areas. So start with the company, not the job. Because if you start with the job, you may never find a place you want to work for. Start with a company, find a hiring manager, plan a call, and then market yourself. And maybe there's a job. You know what I usually say when I market somebody? Um, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. I usually say, hey, I just, you know, my name's Jeff Herzog. I'm the president of a company called FPC in New York. Um, I specialize in placing finance and accounting folks. And I just got an opportunity to represent an individual. He's got an undergrad degree at NYU. He got his master's at Hofstra. Um, he started in, uh, in the Johnson & Johnson rota financial rotation program um, and is currently a, uh, an FP&A manager for one of their franchises. He's not in a rush to make a move, but um, he, uh, you know, he's keeping his eyes and ears open. Who do you know that might be interested in talking to that person? And that's the way you should market yourself. Who do you know that might be interested in talking to me? It's a very different approach, but it's a little less invasive. What your hope is, honestly, is that the person themselves are interested in talking to you. We'll talk about strategic selling in a little bit right now, actually. This is what I talked about earlier, buying influence. Question, Jeff. Sorry. Yeah, please, Lou. No, no. Sometimes so, I get uh, carried away. A, a, a lot of companies pay a finder's fee to employees. This is from Karen, by the way. Um, if you can't access the hiring manager, is it worth it reaching out to another employee and asking them to send in your resume? I couldn't have paid for a better question. Perfect timing, because I'm going to answer it kind of going through this. Um, and this is, again, Miller Hyman wrote a book called Strategic Selling. And uh, I generally like to kind of use it and really kind of outline four different influences at a company and different ways to use them to go up the ladder, down the ladder and understand. And you always want to kind of frame the person you're reaching out to in one of these categories to know how to approach things. So first and foremost, and foremost, as a coach, that's probably the lowest level person. It could be a neighbor. It could be it could be anybody at the company that's not directly tied to what you're trying to accomplish. But their person acts as a guide. They can help you to kind of point you in the right direction. But it's not let me send you my resume. It's who would you suggest I reach out to? That's the thing. Don't ask for a favor to try to get them, get you in there. That's not generally gonna work. You're gonna put somebody in a bad position. Here's who I am, here's what I do. Who would you recommend I call? I don't have to mention your name if you'd prefer that I don't. So that's a coach. It could be a, a neighbor, a secretary. It could be somebody just in a different department. But then we move on to an economic buyer. That's somebody who is perhaps you know in charge of budget. What will my return be? How much time is it going to take? You don't want to overcomplicate things, but that person can control the buying of your skills and services. All right. So that's somebody at the top, perhaps the top of a division, maybe a GM, maybe a CFO. Then you have a user buyer. And if you're a director of finance, that person is probably the one who's going to hire you, the technically the hiring manager, where the economic buyer has purview perhaps over a much larger budget, right? An economic buyer, maybe if they see an opportunity to hire somebody they need, um, even though they don't have budget for it in that division, they may be able to borrow from somewhere else. They're the ones who make the financial decision to spend money on an opportunity. A user buyer is more focused on one headcount that they are hiring for. So that's sort of rifle shot marketing and maybe a little bit lower level. So if you're a director of finance or a senior manager, that person might be a VP of a specific division. And lastly, the person I like to stay away from is a technical buyer and that's human resources. Cost is a major concern. And you know what drives me nuts? What drives me nuts is human resources folks who decide they heard somewhere weeks ago that we have to be cautious with the amount of money we spend on recruiting fees. So they come to me and they say, well, we can't use recruiters. Well, even if I have a great hire, 
you know, somebody that they may need or somebody, you know, the hiring manager, the, the, maybe the hiring manager knows we need to add headcount. We need to add a, a technical accounting manager um, towards the back half of the year because we're growing our software business and our revenue recognition for ASC 606 is going to change significantly. You think human resources knows that? But if somebody, if you have technical accounting and ASC 606 experience, they may say, hey, I need this type of person for the second half of the year. Can we, can we accelerate the budget to take advantage of this person? HR won't know that, okay? Their job is to make sure you are put in a, in a box, follow a process. They can't say yes because they're not, generally speaking, they don't have the budget. The budget lives with the division. So don't call somebody who can't say yes to you. Does that make sense? I hope that answers the question, but yes, you don't have to be perfect to find exactly the right person you're calling. You should just make a phone call and try your best. So I'm really big at this. Um, you know, this group is great because you guys talk and, and Lou happens to be a phenomenal moderator. I think I've spoken at no less than eight different chapters of the FANG in throughout New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Um, but um, make sure you're getting value out of networking and that you're not, not working. Be selective, have a plan, focus on high value contacts when we're able to go back um, to actually going to networking events and CLE events. Um, identify people, try to figure out who's going to be there, who are going to be the speakers, target them, reach out to them ahead of time. Make it, just don't make it misery loves company because that's not working. OK, and you want to stay away from that one on one time is key. Make sure to get people's contact information. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. And, you know, the fang will probably hate me for it. But, you know, making up business cards if you're not working is the wrong idea. In this day and age, get somebody's email address, send them your resume. Networking, we're going to talk about on LinkedIn in a little bit. Uh, and actually, the next slide, I think partner with um, specific uh, recruiters and plan on giving more than you get. Um, you know, L Lou has, it, it's really important because part of why I stay in touch with Lou is that he, ref the people he refers to me are high quality people. Okay. It don't just refer anybody. It's your reputation on the line, because if you're perceived to be somebody who just keeps sending me people, that's not here. Here's the ugly truth. Okay. The ugly truth is is that most recruiters don't have jobs that are good for most of the folks on this call because most of you guys have a lot of experience and they don't want to talk to you, right? Because they get paid by their companies to find them, you know, the people who are the right age, even though they, they, you're not supposed to judge people like that. But the dirty secret is, is that's what they're looking for. So the more you, you know, keep floating people and friends to recruiters, the less attention you're going to get. Okay. Recruiters are getting paid by companies. Most recruiters work on jobs that are less than 120,000 bucks, the vast majority of them. Okay. So especially in this area, that's not going to be probably mo not going to satisfy most of what we are looking for on this call. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, that's the average salary in my system. And we're, I think, on the higher end. I think our average fee is about 30,000 bucks, which means that, you know, on average, we get 25% of base salary. Um, so, you, you know, you do the reverse math, you'll find that most of our recruiters focus on jobs that are $120,000 um, and below. Um, yeah, a little bit above, but not by much. So the fact of the matter is, is that you really just want to, the, 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 the bottom line is you got to be your own recruiter, okay? And here's a, just a, a picture of what LinkedIn um, search looks like. All I did um, just up here and it, it is, is just put in the word finance. Okay. And then you pare it down. You, you're going to get a choice that says people, jobs, groups, discussions, things like that. Pick people, pick your connections, first, second, or third connections. It's always great to start with your first and second connections. Um, New York metropolitan area. Um, unfortunately, you can't parse that any better. 
um, with LinkedIn. Um, then you'll get a choice of current companies. But then here, there are a whole host of, uh, click on all filters. And when you click on all filters, you're gonna get this drop down that you can get a lot more filters to narrow your search from 86,000 results. Um, so, so do that. Um, you think it's worthwhile? You want me to show my screen? Sure, go ahead, Jeff. Let me see. While you're doing this, uh, I'll just point out that something that always uh, has stayed with me was from one of our early on conversations. I, I mentioned the FANG to you and you said, yeah, it's good. It's, it's good support. Um, it's good for you to like get out there and talk to people and practice. Just be careful of the pity party. Yep. And, and, and it, that stayed with me. And, uh, you know, we make sure at this chapter that we never let it turn into that because it can, good. sometimes it can be, it could be really tough on, on folks. It is tough. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to make light of the fact that being unemployed and searching for a job when you've got 20, 30 years of experience just sucks. But, but, but talking about it and belaboring it and, and being upset about it is the worst thing you can do. You've yep. got to pick yourself. Guess what? Being a recruiter that doesn't have any jobs is the worst job in America, right? Trying to go get jobs to work on is awful. So as you can see, I'm working through this um, and just continuing to, to pare down the number of people, current companies. You know, here's a whole host of current still companies. seeing your, your PowerPoint. Oh, really? Uh, and and uh, you, you probably... I would have to reshare. I'd have to stop sharing and then reshare. Yeah, stop, stop share and then reshare your entire screen, I think is what would help you. That better? Uh, yes. Yeah, you're in LinkedIn. Yeah. Go. Okay, so I've gone through and I did a simple finance search. Um, I clicked on people. It's gonna give you a list of current companies. Click on all filters, and then you can actually see everything that you, you can add companies um, that you're looking for. So let's say we wanna add, um, what's a, a, a company that makes sense? Um, some of the big ones have all left. Markham, is that what you do? I meant to, no. Um, trying to think of whatever the case may be. Maybe I want, maybe there's, you know, a job out in, or somebody out in, uh, um, you can pick past companies, current companies, um, what school they went to. So maybe you went to NYU Stern School of Business, what industry, financial services, um, keep going, obviously, you know, most part English, um, service categories, finance, accounting. E words, and then hit show results. So, oh. That's weird. Yeah, I think I, I think I went a little too tight. Well, let's let's go away from this and just go. So now I have 12 results of people I might have gone to school with, which I didn't go to NYU, but if you did, um, just to give you an idea and find out where they're at right now. Maybe you throw them a quick note, reach out to them. Who do you know? Here's who I am. Here's what I do. Who do you know that might be interested in talking to me? But it narrows it down. It gives you some commonality. It's utilizing LinkedIn. This is all free, by the way. These are free filters that many people may not have seen. Um, I mean, you can run all sorts of, you know, a Boolean searches here, which you don't really have to. I think that the, the, these filters really help a lot. So it's something you should do to narrow down based on the companies you want to work for. So hopefully that's helpful. Right.
And one of the points I, I made before was you can you can search for jobs, but you should really target companies. Um, companies and people, yep. Research on companies. Are you back on my PowerPoint now? Yep. Lou? Okay. So again, um, I, I so years ago when I worked for CareerBuilder.com, um, I was gonna I had a big pitch to sell CareerBuilder at Citibank, and um, they allowed me to actually bring an existing customer, which was kind of a neat idea, right? To to talk about the benefits at this pitch, we actually flew in the VP of recruitment from Motorola out in uh, Arizona. I was having dinner with him on the east side at Smith and Walensky's, and he said to me, "I just don't understand." why companies continue to put recruiting in human resources. Recruiting is sales and human resources is what happens after you get hired. And he, had the, he was one of the few people who had the, real, the, the exact right idea. Human resources is after you get hired. HR tries to add science to an otherwise sloppy art. Recruiting is sloppy. Most companies are terrible at recruiting. That's why I have an industry. And to be honest with you, companies are using us more than ever before. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to say that I think recruiting is here to stay. We opened seven franchises during the pandemic, all with corporate executives who wanted to do something different and get out of the corporate rat race. Sometimes they didn't want to leave their homes. They were, you know, one guy, um, you know, and moved to Palm Coast, Florida to go to, and he was the plant manager for Sea Ray um, boats and, you know, and, and, and water sports. And they closed the plant, but he didn't want to leave. He owned a beautiful house on the beach. So he decided to open up a franchise. Um, so we, you know, we, we're really benefiting from, from this move, um, big focus on, on recruiting. They don't often understand the budget like we talked about before. They're often generalists, even in talent acquisition, and, they, and recruitment falls to the bottom of what they do. They don't answer their phone and they hide behind email. And um, you want to be careful um, because I think um, a lot of career counselors and outplacement firms really, I think um, they give very soft advice, you know, cover letters, things like that. It's just such bullshit. Pick up the phone and make a phone call. That's the only way. Don't expect that your resume is going to rise to the top because it's not. So we talked about this already. Sometimes I get ahead of my slides, but you have to have confidence in yourself. You always have to have energy. Make sure you smile when you're talking and be passionate. Don't second guess yourself. Be passionate about the value you can provide a company. Put together company lists. Who do you want to work for? And find people at those companies. We talked about planning. We talked about persistence. Guys, I do it for a fee. For a company to hire you, they don't have to pay you a fee. They just have to pay your salary. For me, like I said, you know, my average fee is actually $32,000 per person. So if someone picks up the phone and they decide to use me for a search, they pay me on average $32,000. That's a lot of money. But if you're marketing yourself and being your own recruiter in the way I'm talking about, then they don't have to. That's an advantage that you have is that you're not coming through a recruiter. So this is the new thing. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, and maybe, maybe I'll be totally wrong, but I listen to Bloomberg. I listen to Bloomberg every morning, um, and uh, I love Bloomberg surveillance. For those of you who um, maybe know Tom Keen, he's brilliant. He's a great speaker. He really is. He's very much, you know, he's very real, but incredibly, like, wicked smart. And they believe, and somebody they had on this morning, one of the guests, they have great guests, said that, we're going to have a very short um, memory of what, uh, what has happened with COVID and the decimation of the office, that we're going to be back. Um, and that I think we're going to be doing more and more face-to-face -face work and interviewing, but we have to talk about the stuff. To me, phone interviews are the, a thing of the past. I have a client I was just dealing with. Um, I had to tell the hiring manager, he was doing 30 minute phone screens for the first um, interview. I said, stop. I said, you're wasting your time. You better do a video interview because you got to sell this candidate on why they should be um, coming to work for you. So to me, I would request it at, 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 at any turn. Make, look at it as an advantage. Um, 
make sure people ask me all the time, what's your, what's the etiquette, you know, for dress, you know, on a video interview. I said, I wasn't going to talk about, you know, pressing your shirt, but just be, you know, be, be smart. I I had one guy um, who apologized for his pandemic hair and his sloppy shirt. My client didn't hire him. I mean, he thought he was out in California so he could be that way. It was the biggest joke that he was wearing a wrinkled t-shirt and he was just, it was not groomed well. Um, it was embarrassing for me because I didn't video interview him first and I should have. So be smart. Everybody on this call has to appreciate. I don't care what it is you're doing, wear a, a button shirt, wear a sport jacket, whatever the case may be, just err on the side of being smart. Don't ask the question, what's the dress? there's a, a lot of misconceptions. You know, a lot of people believe in the hard nosed truth of the matter is that remote work has some significant negatives because you may be, you know, you may feel like you have an advantage because you're local to New York, but guess what? There are people, companies that are local to New York that may be hiring somebody from Colorado because they can do it remotely and they can pay a lot less and they can expand the talent. What that should mean for you is that you've got to expand your search. If you want to work, you may get an opportunity. So there's a positive because you can actually get hired from companies anywhere in the country. But the negative is local companies are able to hire people from anywhere. You know, New York's an interesting place. And um, I'll be honest with you. If it wasn't for my mother-in-law, I wouldn't live here. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, it's, it's crazy. You know, now we, you know, you get rid of the salt tax and it's, it's nuts, man. I mean, my friends are here. My life is here, born bred. I, you know, I was born in Yonkers, grew up in Westchester. I live in Old Beth Page right now. Um, I, it, it's just crazy to me. Then I probably won't live here past when my 14 year old twins go off to college. So um, I'd highly consider if I were you guys, you know, looking out elsewhere and, and, and understanding you just breaking the mold. So I know it's hard to think about, but there's a lot of opportunities and um, New York may, may not look similar to what we're used to, uh, um, you know, come six months now. Um, it's really interesting. So I made two placements at a company not too long ago. Um, actually, just recently, the second one just, just was today. Um, they started searches three months ago and their idea was that they were going to have people, they wanted people within driving distance of the office because they wanted them there once a week and for any big meetings. Two different hiring managers at the same company. By the end of the searches, they had changed the dynamic. One was a senior manager who, um, one of the person I was placing was a senior manager um, who lived in Boston. Company's headquartered in Stanford. Um, so it was a little bit far out. By the end, they made him agree to relocate within a year. The other one, lived in Northern New Jersey for Stanford, Connecticut. And he was looking at the job with the idea that the hiring manager said to him at the beginning of the search, we only need you here once a week. Now he wants him at least twice a week. We're already starting to see the shift back, I think towards people wanting to be in person for a lot of companies. So keep in mind that they may say they're flexible, but they want in-person employees. Question from Suzanne. Um, yeah. What do you suggest we put as our location in LinkedIn? Uh, greater New York area. I think there's maybe ways to make United States, but you know, you know, you, New York, greater New York area definitely has uh, it has some panache to it. But um, you know, for for who I don't know, you know, from a finance perspective, it could be. Uh, viewed as a good thing. I would tell you, don't put your, your address on your resume um, unless it's a local company for you. Um, if it's a local company, definitely put your address on the resume. If it's not a local company and you're applying to a remote job, just put your phone number and your email address. That's more common these days. All right, you're going against the FANG guidelines, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm generally going against most guidelines, Lou. Sorry. <laughs> We should have talked about it beforehand. <laughs> it's fine. You, you know, okay. you know what I say about resumes, right? If uh, you listen to everybody's advice, you'll be left with your name, some periods, and commas. Yeah, and I usually take out most commas. So, 
Um, all right, so real quickly, um, we're kind of coming to the end. Unique interviewing tips and techniques. Like I said, it's not about shining your shoes and not about you know, making sure your hair is done properly. Always come across as somebody who feels lucky, okay? Um, successful people feel lucky to have had the experiences that they've had that bring them to this point in time. When people feel lucky, they work hard to stay that way. Be a make it happen person, not a, not a let it happen person who lets circumstances dictate their career. You don't want to give off the impression that the company you're interviewing with is going to be the, story, the, the subject of your next woe is me story. OK, you always want to come across as somebody who feels lucky despite the misery and job searching sucks. You don't want to ever talk about that. Look, you know what? I'm really excited. It's exciting that the market is coming back. I'm really looking forward to finding a company that I can leverage all my skills and experience and help that company to reach their goals. We talked about make it happen versus let it happen. There's nothing worse I had a candidate interviewing at that um, at that company up in Stanford, and he worked for. Uh, he was currently at a, a, another company. It was an international company that has their their U.S. headquarters in uh, in the in Trumbull, I think, Connecticut. Um, and we talked ahead of going out on the interview, um, and told him because he was really negative with me about his current company. Systems are antiquated. They're not listening to me. I said, I said, Paul, you're not going to talk about this on the in the meeting. He's like, No, of course. Um, you're my recruiter. That's the other thing, guys. Your recruiter is not your therapist. So, and nor is the, your lawyer. There is no, there is no, you know, recruiter candidate confidentiality. All right. So if a candidate to me, generally speaking, bashes his company, generally speaking, I'm not going to, or is negative, I'm probably not going to present them. I happen to present this guy because his experience was spot on. Um, he couldn't, he did a panel interview with five people and two of the three, two of the five people said, all he could talk about was how bad his current situation is. And I really don't want somebody like that. When I say balance, balance is imp so important in when you're interviewing, you want to have a balance between being confident, but when you're too confident and you get out of balance, you become arrogant. You want to be assertive but not aggressive. Aggressive kind of has a negative connotation. And you want to be enthusiastic about the opportunity, but not like jumping across the desk or jumping through the computer screen with enthusiasm because you don't want to give somebody the impression that it's the only opportunity for you. You never want to use superlatives. Oh my God, this is the perfect job for me. That's not the way you want to be. Superlatives kill your credibility. Be self-aware. Mostly self-awareness comes in the form of making sure you don't talk too much. Answer the question, pause, and let the conversation go back and forth. You know, you may, you may be answering a question and it's getting a little long-winded and then a new, another answer, another point you want to make comes up in your head. Just stop. You can always come back to it because there's nothing worse. I've had people email me saying, I asked this guy, well, during an interview, I asked this guy one question and he's been talking for 15 minutes. You have to be aware. Think of it as a, a tennis match back and forth over the net versus hitting the ball against the wall. You've got to, it's got to be a two-way discussion. We talked about this earlier. Ask not what the company can do for you, but what you can do for the company. When someone asks you, and I talked to Enzo about this earlier, um, when you're asked something like, well, what are you looking for in a new job? The answer should never be something like, well, I'm looking for a company that can help me to grow. I'm looking for a company that can provide me opportunity to do different things and be challenged. No, that's not what it's about. When you're asked the question, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a company where I can leverage all my skills and experience and help that company to reach their goals. That's a matter of the value you can provide to them. STAR, if you're not familiar with it, really important when you're asked a question, this should always remind you to use quantifiable accomplishments to support your answers. What was the situation? The tasks involved were the action I took and ultimately the result to the business was. Situation, task, action, and result. 
We talked earlier about having a ton of information. We have access to all this information. And for you guys, it's, you know, it's probably standard. If you're going to interview at a publicly traded company, you're probably reading the 10K, right? That's fine. That's smart. But the information you gain by doing all this research is only as good as how you use it. If you all of a sudden spit out, you know, the, the fact that their PE ratio has improved significantly and their free cash flow has, you know, done really well. Sometimes it's like, you know what, what did you do the research for? Information that you have is only as good as how you use it. Use it in, it's sort of a back pocket thing. And you can say, oh, you know what? I actually did notice. If company's talking about how, you know, their stock price is doing really well. You know, I happen to notice your profitability is up. You know, the, the, the PE ratio is improved. Stock price has is, is, is really done well. That's fine, but it's got to be within the confines of the discussion. You're not there to prove to somebody that you can do a lot of research. When you ask questions, ask open-ended questions. I love phrases to me that I like to use, and you can use this for any question. Or talk to me about or help me to understand. Talk to me about some of the challenges you're facing right now. Help me to understand the land, the, the landscape today and what your goals look like for the coming six to 12 months. And my favorite question to ask, and I, I, I encourage people to ask it just this way is what would you hope for me to accomplish in the first six months? Not what are you looking for this person to do? What would you hope for me to accomplish in the first six months? Because if this person is looking at your resume, they may say that you did something at your last company that they really need help with. And now all of a sudden they are seeing you in the role, not just the role, not just anybody in the role. And then close. Always say, I encourage people, you know, far too many people, they get all gushy and hey, thank you so much for making time today. Guess what? You're making time also. What I generally like to say is I'm really glad we got an opportunity to talk today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm excited about the opportunity. I think I can make a big impact. What are next steps? Where do we go from here? It's a bit of a different tone. And what do we do to get started? Go do some research tonight. Find 20 companies that you'd like to work for. Don't worry about whether or not they have jobs and start researching people that you think makes sense for you to talk to. Make a plan, put the name, company name, title, see if you can find the main company phone number and then start getting on the phone and marketing yourself. With that, um, I think that brings us to the end, Lou. Wow, that was fantastic, yeah, thank you so much. I, it's my pleasure. I, I have to tell you that if you look at the chat, like you'll see all the little pearls of wisdom that I typed in there uh, while you were speaking. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I really preach that you hit on here is that everybody in this uh, room today, uh, this Zoom room today, uh, is really talented and has uh, ha have accomplished some really incredible things in, in their careers. Um, and they've done that by uh, planning their work and working their plan uh, and, and being really effective at making things happen and, and executing on it. And it always amazes me when uh, I, I speak to you know, candidates who just like me when I was looking for a job, um, had never really had to do it before um, and, and uh, are, are just frozen by it. And yet it is, it is so innate for all of us to create a project plan and work it every day, start to finish, so, so that you're executing on every step of the way. And when you're not executing on it, then why are you not? And what do you need to change to make it work? Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's daunting. But if you don't work this the way, the way Jeff has described, okay, um, it, it's just going to get longer. So uh, great points, Jeff. Thank you so much.